My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science at Elizabethtown College for the past 23 years. I'm recording this in 2002. I've been here since 1999. I was a professor at Purdue University before that, IBM Research before that, uh, AI DuPont Children's Hospital Robotics before that, uh, built high tech office parks in the West and the South before that. So I was 30, I'm 60 years old now. Uh, I've also taught at University of Delaware, San Francisco State University, and the University of Trento in Italy. Uh, part of so visiting professor in Italy, PhD course. So this is Apollo rocket behind me. Uh, it's worth mentioning that when I was in Italy too, uh, we, we partnered with the European Space Agency, and they were building a, a graviton wave detection thing in the basement, and uh, I got to look at that and talk to the researchers about that. They were actually my students uh, building it. Screen. So we're in this course here. You find this off of my off of my web page. Uh, I'll go into that here. Students go into the Canvas database uh, educational software. We used to use Blackboard before that and folders before that. I avoided all that until COVID and just use my own web pages. But, uh, and Canvas was worked out really nice. And it's one-stop shopping for all assignments and all courses. So students hopefully can get their time management under control, which has become more of an issue in recent decades with everybody flooded with information. <clears throat> so I don't, don't wanna make it any more difficult for them. So anyway, we're doing cash right now. And these are all, this whole entire course now after this next recording and when I, uh, We'll put it on the web server here as an mp4 and then upload to youtube the entire course will then be on the internet accessible different places call server for however many years to the future and youtube presumably forever so this is a pdf now i'm going to narrate and it's not very long at all it's just a couple of pages, actually. So, um, and again, there's a much longer lecture that's linked to that you can listen to in advanced computer engineering. It's actually an hour and three quarters long, and it's really meant to be about four hours long. It'll talk really fast in the video. Uh, not here. <laughs> so, um, there's four different kinds of cache, and cache just uh, the idea of cache is. You want something, you did something recently with data or instructions, and you want to do it again as fast as possible. So you put it in this little piece of memory that's faster and closer to the process. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's with, well, let's back up here. Caching in general, there's different kinds of caching. The memory cache is what we're talking about here in processor. You also have software caches, internet caches, your browsing history, disk caching, We'll talk about that with storage, uh, cache server for network devices. Uh, and so there's, there's four different things. But we're mostly interested in this course in the memory cache uh, uh, for processes. And so you see we have shared ones and individual ones. Uh, we don't get into that here. But, uh, and the main idea uh, the students have already seen this down here in another presentation. I'll uh, start the pictures at the bottom here. So if you have symmetric multiprocessing, also formerly known as shared memory processing, um, you have one memory. And this is typically what PCs still do. Even if you have 12 cores, you still have just one memory. Uh, and, it, and that memory is, is talked to by all the processors. Here's just three. You know, these can be cores too, processors, cores. It's the same thing. Well, I mean, now you say the processor has multi cores in it, but one processing element, one CPU, each core is a CPU also. And so if you have your own cache, there's only one cache shown here. There's there are often levels of caching and, and actually shared interleaved caches too. Certainly not going to get into that here. Uh, um, that's typical. And then you have way a computer network would look or a massively parallel processing system where the caches 
belong to each of the processors or the cores, uh, and you know you don't mess with them. Over here, it's a mess. You have to maintain cache coherency with symmetric multiprocessing because there's only one memory location for each piece of data, but you know each processor could be trying to mess with it. Uh, it often does. And so you have to have a policy and some kind of control, overhead control system, invalidate other caches when one cache has control, lock out the others, or flush them. Um, so the two main principles here, uh, computer memory cache design is um, uh, probability theory for speeding up computer performance. So you know, what do you put in your cache? Well, um, there's temporal and spatial locality reference. So you can guarantee I'm going to ask you about those. I think highlighted, I've mentioned them in other places too. And this is the main thing here. Uh, for these memory caches, which uh, uh, these static RAMs we talked about, there are more expensive, less dense, but faster RAM, static RAM versus dynamic RAM. Uh, we want to hold copies of data instructions that were recently used, recently used. I probably should bold face that because that's the time element recently used so that the processor or cores, as I mentioned, the CPUs, can access data and instructions faster um, the next time things are needed. Uh, things that are probably needed next, probably. Right? There's old strategies to doing this. Not, and there's different ways. It's not one fixed solution. There's ranges of solutions pluses and minus to each. Uh, so that's temporal, right? You just did something, you want to do it again. Now, and that's like the most important part of the cache, but uh, well, they're both very important because where, do, you know, the spatial has to do with, okay, if I just did something, what am I likely to do next? Well, yeah, I might do the same thing. I might need the same piece of data. I might execute the same code, but, in all likelihood, if I'm stepping through an array, I'm going to need the next piece of data in the array, which is located sequentially, spatially, at the next address. If I'm stepping through code execution, fetching one at a time, assuming I'm not branching or a subroutine call or an interrupt happens, which happens, but in all probability, most likely won't happen as often. I'm going to need what's spatially located next to what I just used. So, you know, I just use something and then now I want to put it in the cache, assuming it wasn't in there, you know, in a cache. Now I put that piece in the cache, but I want to grab some other stuff with it. I grab a chunk, a chunk. So, uh, again, in static RAMs, we want to hold copies of data instruction in chunks. Probably should hold that too, called cache lines or cache blocks. Just different names for the same thing, different textbooks. Uh, when we have a cache miss, it means, okay, what we're looking for is not in the cache. The instruction's not there to fetch. The data is not there that we're using for the operands, right? Uh, when the CPU looks in a cache for something, that's a cache miss, and it's not there, what do we do? We grab a big chunk, not too big. So this, you know, there's uh, laws of diminishing marginal returns. Anybody's had economics or any? any kind of optimization thing like you don't always get the same amount of benefit for each incremental bit of effort you put in so if you make the thing the cache you grab too big of a chunk you're going to use up all the space in the cache and you won't have room for other blocks you have to bump out stuff out of the cache right and then that stuff isn't there to be a fast access you just bump something out so you don't want too big of a chunk and that our instructions uh, and so we, and we're grabbing a chunk because uh, probably the processor, of course, will want to access things physically located next to each other, physically, electrically, you know, physically. Uh, 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 to each other when, if uh, looks in the cache next time. And the time after that, examples are data and array or instructions in a loop. And there, here's this law of diminishing turns it's funny i forget what i've put on here sometimes but yes i think i put this on a couple of years ago i kept saying it over and over again i didn't have it right the law of diminishing margin returns it's actually from economics or business the cash line or cash block size is optimized based on the law of diminishing margin returns 
like in business or economics, where you gain speed up as you increase cash size, block cash line block size, chunk size that you're grabbing, and that there's slots that are certain size to grab a chunk that you put in it, right? So, uh, um, but you gain a little bit less with each incremental increase in size. And at some point, you actually begin losing speed up because you're taking up too much of the overall cash size with individual lines and blocks that are too big. And therefore, the probability of having a needed cash line block in the cache is reduced. Right? So there's probability all over the place, like probability that the actual block, the chunk that I want, you know, is in the slot. And if there's not enough slots or, you know, the chunk that I want's not in there, you know, what's the probability of it being in there? Um, then I lose out. And also within the chunk, I've grabbed a big enough chunk that in all probability, I'm because of the locality, spatial locality of reference, I'm grabbing the next uh, thing located, next array element of data or the next line of code. Uh, so you know, nested probabilities. And again, we designed, uh, we talk about that more in other classes. So if you, uh, go down here and look in the notes. Now I've actually put a link to that. Um, I didn't put it on this one yet, but I, I'm gonna write, I just wrote this this morning because we're gonna play this next here, which is uh, IBM research that I did um, that's at a higher level than this introductory course. I'm gonna teach an advanced course. And then this cache design, I'm also gonna put a note right there that says this level of detail is covered in advanced course. And it's the same one, 433. It's going to change its name to 430 now. It's just something I do. But, uh, so, on my website, if you go in here, uh, it's all the computer engineering stuff and the lab manuals, right? And everything. So, down in here in the advanced course, uh, it's all this stuff here. And then, in there, if you want to learn more about cache design, it's it's down here. Uh, now this is also, uh, this particular talk is also on YouTube. So go there. I haven't put all these talks on YouTube. I'm actually in the process of putting all advanced computer engineering on YouTube also, as well as my architecture things. Which is, uh, so the, you're in here, high, the intro high tech lectures, here's the advanced high tech lectures. Uh, we're not going to go into it now, but here's this cache design here, an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, I just click on it, but I'm not going to go into it. You can just see there's lots of stuff in there. It's just, just lots of stuff. Stuff looks like, like uh, this. We got to look at the PDF to really figure out what the heck is going on there. I, can, I have a PDF always located below in the YouTube videos so you can drill down and zoom in. Uh, again, I'm not gonna talk about this now, let me just show you if you're curious. And somebody in this course, if they wish to do a research paper on caches, if they're not going to have advanced computer engineering with me, which would only be the computer engineers, then you might wanna do a whole talk on this kind of thing, you know, research paper. So you can see the details here of what goes on with uh, caches and performance up and things and mapping techniques. IBM, I wrote a program, part of the custom kernel that we wrote in the APIs that I wrote was to cause errors by having the caches uh, compete when they share a memory location called thrashing where they're smashing away trying to uh, uh, trying to use the same piece of data and you make that happen over and over and over again in, in an improbable way that would simulate a lifetime of the machine over 50 years, you know, with, within a couple of days of testing. All right, so I believe we're done now with this. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna stop this video right here. Sharing, turn the phone off, which, which time?